showed me was when we talk about Christmas and we talk about that gift that we want, and what everybody wants, what's their special gift? Well, what God showed me was if God was standing before you and we were to ask God, what do you want, God? I can guarantee you 110% of myself, I know he would say you. And uh, Sister Debbie had tagged me in this on Facebook, and I thought it was very fitting, and I wanted to, to read it to you this morning. It says, if you look for me at Christmas, you won't need a special star. I'm no longer just in Bethlehem. I'm right there where you are. You may not be aware of me amid the celebrations. You'll have to look beyond the stores and all the decorations. But if you take a moment from your list of things to do, and listen to your heart, you'll find I'm waiting there for you. Amen. You're the one I want to be with. You're the reason that I came. And you'll find me in the stillness as I'm whispering your name. Amen. I thought about that and Sister Debbie and said, Mary, Sister Mary, this goes along with what you said. And, and that is so true. When we talk about that gift that Jesus wants or that God wants, all he wants is me. All he wants is you. And that's what we're here for today. We're here one more time to be able to worship His lovely name. Let's all stand and sing this song.
$600 in that service and $400 of that they had initially told us there was 59 rooms in the Hampton Inn there's 80 rooms in the Hampton Inn so at $5 a Bible $400 we were able to be a part of putting Bibles in the Hampton Inn there in Middleburg they'll be opening up real soon but I had the honor Friday of being a part of that dedication service and uh, being there for that dedicating that hotel and the manager there she's a Christian and and uh, the workers there, we was able to, to minister to some of them while we were there. Uh, some different pastors joined in with the Gideons, and we just had a wonderful time there. Uh, the lead uh, Gideon for Clay County shared a testimony of a lady in Seattle, Washington. It was very interesting that he shared that testimony because I was just thinking about uh, the very thing that he was sharing, how many people check in the hotel room for the purpose of taking their lives. And he shared a testimony of a lady who had checked into a hotel room to, to do just that. And she got a hold of that Gideon Bible. And she began to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. She did not take her life. She left that hotel. She went to a friend that had been witnessing to him, witnessing to her, and, and talked with him. And he prayed with her. And she invited the Lord into her heart. And the, the head man, not the one over to Clay County, but all of the Gideons that was there, he, he gave a rest of the story. Now, I remember Paul Harvey. He said, here's the rest of the story. And he said the rest of the story was he was sharing that testimony in, in a church in Washington. And a man came to him after service. He said, when you said the name of the lady, it blew my mind because that lady is my boss. And he said, we knew, we knew what happened. We didn't know the whole story. And he said, I can affirm to you, she's a changed person. She used to be awful to work for and awful to be around. But ever since that encounter, she's wonderful to work for. She's wonderful to be around. You know what that is? That's the power. And the redemptive power, the saving power, the delivering power of Jesus Christ. So they, they shared that testimony. I, I, I stayed after all the other pastors left. And they were uh, telling us have a good day and all of that. And I looked at them. I said, I come to work. Can I help put these Bibles in the room? And they allowed me to do that. Usually, only the Gideons do that. So I had the distinct privilege of, of being able to place uh, Bibles in several of the rooms there at the Hampton Inn as we was placing those Bibles. I shared with them my mom's story. And as I shared with them my mom's story, and I said, I don't know uh, uh, the placement of the Gideon Bible, but I'm sure there was one in that room. So I was sharing with them my mom's story. But after that, my mind got turning and then the, the desire to be a police officer that I've always had, the detective to begin to investigate and begin to rise up in me. So I began to make some phone calls. So I called the Econo Lodge in Brunswick, Georgia, where my mother took her life. And I asked the lady there that answered the phone. I said, I just got one question for you. It's going to seem kind of strange. Uh, but do you have Gideon Bibles in your hotel rooms? She said, yes, sir, we do. We do have that. I said, thank you. And I went to ask her, how long have you had it? She had already hung up. And I, so I began to make some phone calls. And I'm still still investigating. I'm trying to, to get, uh, I don't want to see pictures of the scene. I just want to know if there was a Bible involved in that. But uh, I, I know that encounter and I know the whole. But anyway, I shared that testimony with them. And that brother came up to me with one of those Bibles. And it just touched my heart. And I told him of the hope that I had, how they found my mother as uh, she was over the tub and all of that stuff that you've heard many times. And he handed me one of those Gideon Bibles. He said, I want you to have this. I want you to keep this in your office or wherever you want to keep it. I've got it in my truck in my center console. He said, I want you to hold on to this. And then he opened it up. He said, if there was a Bible in that room, this is the first thing she saw when she opened it up. The plan of salvation. And ask questions there. Are you are you contemplating suicide? Was one of the questions in there. And it's a list of questions, and then a list of answers, and a list of prayers, a list of things to do, and, and begin to share that. So I, I've got to have that Gideon Bible that they place in those rooms. I've got it in my my truck, and uh, I'm just thankful for that. So I began that just began to flood my mind this week. So I said all of that to say this: we get emotional this time of year, and we think about those that are not here with us, and. And, and we think of Christmas as of old. I, I, I can think back at all of those Polaroid pictures that I've seen. That they're up here. I can visualize them in my in my mind. I can visualize uh, uh, some scenes from Christmas as long ago, and I won't share them with you. Uh, images of me and my my side shooters and on my big wheel and all that. I won't share all of those with you. But just just great memories of Christmas as of old. 
but every one of them reminds us, reminds us of His grace. Amen. That's why I love verse 3 of Amazing Grace. It's His grace that brought me this far. And I know it's His grace that's going to carry me all the way home. And I honor Him this morning. Amen. I exalt Him and I adore Him. And I'm thankful that He's my Savior. I don't know who wrote the song, It Gets Sweeter As The Days Go By, but they were absolutely correct. Amen. It gets sweeter every day. I've been serving Him for 20-something years, close to 30 years probably now. But He has just been so good to me, and I'm thankful for Him this morning. Thankful for His grace and His mercy and His love. Thankful to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. And I know some of you are not feeling well. Uh, the cold that's going around, flu that's going around and all of that. But you've pushed through that. Many of you have and you're here today. So I thank you for your faithfulness to the house of the Lord. Good to have all our visitors with us. Just make yourself at home today. If you have not already in, in time past filled out a visitor's card, please do that. Drop it in the offering here in a few moments. I do want to make uh, one announcement. There are several announcements in our bulletin. Several announcements on the slideshow. There's an announcement in regards to the Middleburg Christmas Parade. Middleburg Christmas Parade is coming up this Saturday. And uh, our youth are going to be in that. And Sister Amanda is extending uh, that to others as well. Uh, the youth and the children. Uh, but she needs to meet with everyone that has any desire. Uh, whether you want your children to be a part of the Christmas Parade. Or you want to be a part of helping and being in that Christmas Parade. She needs to meet with everyone. So if everyone that, that has any interest of joining us Saturday in the Christmas Parade. Any part of the Christmas Parade whatsoever. I need you to hang around right here on this first few rows for just a few moments following service and there's some instruction that she needs to give in that. And uh, how many know that? He told us when he left. He told him he's coming back. He said, the angel said, the same Jesus that you see being called away, he's coming back in like manner. Jesus said in John 14 and 6, they're about leading up to verse 6. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. That where I am, there you may be also. And I'm thankful for that today. I want to see him. I want to look upon his face. I'm thankful for his grace and his mercy today. Thankful for the way the Lord moves and the way he works. I've talked to some and been a part of church seminars and different things, and there's nothing wrong with this, but there's church leaders that have conversations with their music minister and their choir leaders, and they have their line up songs that, that tie in with the message. That's a wonderful idea. But I always forget to do that. But I pray. A music director prays. A song leader prays. And God does that that I forget to do. He lines everything up just the way it's supposed to be. So I'm thankful for these ladies this morning leading those wonderful songs in this Christmas season about adoring Him and about lifting up Him and about exalting Him today. And I just want to sing this song this morning. How do we touch him? How many ever felt his touch? Thank you for his touch this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to sing for him. So worship with me to this morning as I testify in song of how he touched him.
you worthy, you worthy of all praise. Take your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1 and also Matthew. According to the spirit of holiness. By the resurrection from the dead. By whom we have received grace. And apostleship. For obedience to the faith among all nations. For his name. First three words says concerning his son. The last three words say for his name. That word concerning there means. In regards to to relate or belong to. How many have ever received the phone call and said, I want to speak to you concerning your car warranty? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. But we want to talk this morning, not, I want to talk to you not concerning your car warranty, but concerning this, uh, this morning. Will you stretch your hands towards heaven? Let's ask God to touch us today. Father, I come yielded to you right now, surrendered to you, submitted to whatever your will is for each life here today. That's what we want. And we just pray, Father God, that you would just minister and move in the house of God today. Let your anointing be upon me to preach. Let your anointing be upon each one to receive today. And I just ask you to touch us and help us and strengthen us this morning with your great anointing. We'll pray you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seen. Matthew, Gospel, Chapter 1, we find here the story of Jesus' birth. Luke chapter 2 is the most popular place that it's shared from. But Matthew chapter 1 gives an encounter of Joseph's uh, interaction with the Holy Ghost during this time. We know that the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, overcame, overcame upon her. She was with child, she could see. And she was pregnant, the virgin birth. And, and that's a miracle, that's miraculous, and that's wonderful for us to look back on. But there was a man that she was engaged to, a spouse to at that time by the name of Joseph. That, that was uh, raised great, great questions for him, to say the least. Amen. And so he was concerned about this. So he did what any man of God would do when he's concerned about some things. He began to pray. He began to meditate, he began to thank of the Lord. And here, verse, beginning in verse number 18, we find that this story begins to unfold. In my Bible, the heaven says the birth of Jesus. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his, when, uh, when, as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found the child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, 
And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Verse 22, Now all of this was done that might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord of the prophets, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which be interpreted as God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till that she had brought forth her firstborn son, and they called his name Jesus. We find that, as I said, that Joseph was troubled about these things. But the Heavenly Father sent an angel appeared to him, and he went, wanted to talk to him concerning who? Concerning Jesus. Concerning his son. Co concerning his son, the only begotten of the Father. And he said to Joseph, he began to explain and unfold to Joseph here in these verses that, that, that may be hard for him to understand, but he began to unfold to him the things concerning his son, the purpose that he was sent, but he also wanted to speak to Joseph concerning his part of raising that child, Jesus. And so he spoke to him about that. The same father that sent a messenger to speak to Joseph there that day concerning his son. Son, is the same Father today that sent a messenger to speak to you and me this morning concerning that same Son. He wanted to speak to Joseph concerning his part in the life of Jesus. And He wants to speak to us today concerning our part in making Him known to all of the world. I shared Wednesday night that we have a great responsibility as the church to go into all the world teaching and preaching the name of Jesus. And so as I said before, that word concerning means in regards to, to relate or belong to. And so we see here that when we think of that word concern, how many would agree this morning there's a lot of things that can concern us. A lot of things that bring us concern. There's a lot of things that will begin to uh, uh, begin to deal with areas of our lives, uh, and especially during this holiday season. Uh, there's a lot of concerns. Uh, we don't have to go down those concerns, but you know, uh, there's a lot of concerns uh, during the holiday season. Uh, but during this Christmas season, uh, and we wanted to focus on the whole month of December. I started last Sunday morning. Uh, I just want Paul said, uh, I don't want to know anything among you except for Jesus Christ uh, and Him crucified. Uh, so I don't want to preach anything uh, in this, this month uh, outside of the realm of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so as I begin to prepare and look uh, and begin to feel in my heart, uh, I preached a message with the same title before on Easter Sunday. Uh, but God just began to build this in my heart as I got up yesterday and began to put this together. Uh, it's been in my mind and my heart all week. Uh, and as I begin to prepare, uh, I feel like the Lord wants to talk to us this morning uh, concerning His Son. Uh, the Father wants to speak to us about that. Uh, why He came. Why He lived. Uh, why He died. Why He is moving in our midst today. Uh, he spoke to Joseph before Jesus was ever born uh, concerning His Son. Uh, and how what His part was in raising Him. Uh, and He wants to speak to each one of us today uh, concerning His Son and our part uh, in, this, in our presentation uh, to Him to a lost world. Back in our text, we find that Paul was writing here. And when he's writing, he realizes the subject matter of, of what he's writing. He realized the subject matter of what he's presenting here to the Romans as he starts off this letter. And that subject matter is concerning Christ. You notice something about Paul. I just began to, I got curious yesterday and began to do a word search. And I didn't get an amount of time, but I can tell you it's a lot. That when Paul is writing these letters, whether it's to the Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians, all of these books, when you begin to look through there, and Paul begins to talk about Christ. We've heard the story of Paul's conversion, that he was Saul, that became Paul. He was, he was a man who was very knowledgeable theological knowledge and, and the things of the law. But he had an encounter on the road to Damascus that everything changed. He became a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
And so we find something about Paul and his writings, and, and, and especially here in our text this morning, and throughout all his writings we see this, uh, that he realizes the subject matter of it that was concerning Christ. Now, here's the problem that I have with a lot of the new versions of the Bible, is they do not put the same emphasis that Paul put on it. You'll see in some places that it says Jesus Christ our Lord, as Paul wrote, and some of those versions will take and just put Jesus or Christ or Lord. But Paul did not do that. He honored Him in every fashion of it. He honored the deity of Christ. So he knew, so he, if you, if you would, he stepped it up a little bit when he began to talk to Christ. How many knows that if they say that the president's coming or the king is coming or, or the bosses are, are showing up on the job, they, they clean up things a little better. They tell you to, to dress a little better. It may be casual Friday, but not this Friday because the big bosses are come in. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. So, so they begin to step it up a little bit. Uh, so that's what Paul did. He stepped it up uh, when he began to talk about Christ. Uh, he, he, can, he can mention any other name. Uh, listen, you don't have to uh, have a lot of admiration when it comes uh, to speaking about just individuals. Uh, he could have just said, yeah, my buddy Peter uh, or my friend John. Uh, but when he said, got to Jesus, uh, he began to perk up uh, and he said, I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ. Uh, our Lord, I want to speak to you concerning His Son, the one that's thrown me down on the road to Damascus. What a great honor and what a great privilege it is to speak of His Son. Yes, amen. Your pastor's got it all spoken outside of the pulpit, and people say, Well, why does he, why do their preachers get a different preaching voice? And, and it seems like uh, things change. Number one's the anointing. And number two, I have the great privilege to speak to you this morning uh, concerning His Son. Amen. I've got the great privilege uh, of speaking to you concerning not just His Son, uh, but He went on to say here, uh, He realized who He was talking about. Uh, he said not just concerning His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, but He said our Lord. Uh, so I'm not just talking to you about some God's Son. Uh, I'm talking to you about the Word uh, that became flesh uh, and dwelt among us. bore witness of Him to Him and understanding something. He is the true treasure hid right there in the field of the Scriptures. Paul understood that. Paul got a hold of that. And so he begins to speak of some things about this great Savior. He began to speak on behalf of heaven. The Father made Him the mouthpiece in this letter. And I am so thankful for the opportunity that I have each time that I stand in this pulpit to have an opportunity. I've said it many times. I'm glad and thankful that He called me into the ministry. When I first heard the call, I was not so glad. But I'm glad that I answered the call. And with Paul, I stand before you uh, just as he was writing his text. Uh, when he was writing this text, the realization that he had uh, every opportunity that we have to sing, to teach, to preach, to testify. We understand that uh, it's a great, uh, awesome responsibility that we have and what a treasure we have to speak of. Uh, so in this, he's speaking of how in one person, Jesus Christ, he shows us his two distinct natures. Remember Wednesday night we talked about us having... Two distinct natures. The natural and the spiritual. The natural and the spiritual. Now, each one of us today have that with us today. There's a natural and there's a spiritual. We shared the story of Wednesday night of Cain and Abel, how the natural wanted to destroy the spiritual. And we have here that Paul shares with us about Jesus that when Jesus became flesh, He had the same thing. He was made up, but He shows us His two distinct natures. That first one being His human nature. As He shared there with us in Romans 1 and 3, that He tells us that He was the seed of David. That is, that He was born of the Virgin Mary, who was of the house of David, as was Joseph, the supposed father. That David is mentioned here because of the special promise that God made to him concerning the Messiah, and especially of His kingly office. You begin to, to read 
deep there uh, in the book of Luke uh, and it begins to follow that lineage all the way back to David. Uh, and so he speaks of that natural side. Uh, and then he speaks of us the second thing, uh, his divine nature. Uh, and he declared here uh, that his divine nature was that he was declared to be the Son of God in verse 4. The Son of God by eternal generation. Or, as he explains here, it was according to the Spirit of holiness was Paul's words. And we find here that according to the flesh, that's his human nature, he was the seed of David. But according to the Spirit of holiness, that's his divine nature, uh, as he said to be quickened by that Spirit of holiness, uh, he said he is the Son of God. He said that's who I'm speaking of today concerning his son. And years ago I've heard this song, and it's a wonderful song, that describes very well these two natures. I just want to read it to you. I won't sing it to you this morning. You've already had to endure my singing today. It said, just as a young boy in the temple one day shared with the doctors, they were so amazed. Never had they seen one so young speak so swift. They asked him many questions. The conversation went like this. What's your name, son? On my mother's side, my name is Jesus. But on my father's side, they call me Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. How old are you? On my mother's side, now I'm 12 years. But on my father's side, I've just always been. Yes. Where are you from? On my mother's side, I'm from Bethlehem. But on my father's side, it's New Jerusalem. What's your plan? On my mother's side, I'll be crucified. But on my father's side, in three days, I'll arise and I'll sit on my father's side. I, I couldn't come up with a better explanation of the two sides of Jesus than that. And he, he began to pen. I'm sure, man, that guy had him a shot time when he penned the words of that song. And that's the point. As Paul starts out this letter in Romans chapter 1, he said, that's what I want to talk to you about. Concerning the Son. Why He came. Why He's here. And they begin to ask him this question. Who He is. Where He came from. Listen, if you're going to make Him Lord of your life, don't you want to know these things? And so they begin to question and begin to ask these things. Many begin to wonder, who is this Jesus? Uh, they ask questions like this. Isn't, his, uh, isn't he the son of the carpenter? Because they knew who he was and they saw where he was from on that natural side. Uh, but there were some things happening on uh, the spiritual side. Uh, there were some things that was happening. Uh, isn't this the son of Mary and Joseph? Uh, yes, that's how, you can, uh, that's how you can figure him out on the natural side. Uh, but, but I want to talk this morning concerning uh, his relationship so much with Mary and Joseph. Uh, but Paul said, I want to write to you uh, concerning his son. Uh, and can I tell you something in that verse there? Uh, that his was not Joseph. Right. Yeah. He said, said I want to come to you today concerning Joseph's son. He bypassed the natural side. Uh, and he said, I want to talk to you uh, concerning his son, the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords. Uh, and he came. Uh, On his mother's side, he showed up on a manger. But he said, on my father's side, I've always been. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great God of Jehovah. And he did not come for no reason. He came because there had to be a greater sacrifice for sin. Get this. He came to be crucified. Yes, yeah. he did. He came for the purpose of dying on the cross. Said on my mother's side I'll be crucified. But on my father's side, I will rise again. Amen. So there was a reason for that. Paul goes on to pen in Romans chapter 5. He said, Hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength and due time. Christ died for the ungodly. How many of those he could not have died unless he was born? Right, so this, this season is very important. It's very important. 
He said in verse 7, For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet for a venture for a good man, some would even dare to die. I love this, verse 8. But God commended His love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, let me talk to you concerning His Son. Who's His Son? Christ Jesus. Who's His Son? Christ. And He said, while we were yet sinners, this is why He came. Christ died for us. Christ died for us. So we begin to see this. We begin to look at these two natures. Uh, and Paul begins to share uh, in, in these verses uh, the natures, the divine nature and the, uh, and the natural side of Jesus. Uh, but he shows here, he begins to focus in and hone in uh, on that divine nature. Uh, and he gives a great proof of the demonstration of that divine nature. Uh, and that was of His resurrection from the dead. Uh, and what does resurrection from the dead do? Uh, it proves. Uh, it affects and undeniably. Uh, listen, many men have died. Many men have died for a purpose. It was a common thing for a man to be hung on the cross. That was how sinners were treated. The only difference was the one that they had on that hillside that day was hanging between two thieves. And he was a sinless man on his father's side. He was a sinless man on his mother's side. Because the writer of Hebrews says he was an all points tempted as you and I, yet without sin. So all the way to that cross, he was a sinless man. But then they placed that cross upon his back and he became sin. He became sin. How did a sinless man become sin? Well, Isaiah prophesied of it. He said that he will take the chastisement of our peace upon Him. And He'll take our sins and He carried them up Calvary's hill there that day and they crucified Him as a sinner. Now that was a common thing for them to do. They took and they placed Him there in that tomb and they placed Him there in that tomb. That was a very common thing as well. But what was not common is when they came back to that grave to look for Him, and that angel said, you see Jesus? He ain't here. Your Bible don't say he ain't here. That's Middleburg term. He is risen. He's risen. And so that's the proof of the divine nature. If they couldn't have figured out the 33 and a half years, if many did not understand and there was no proof, how, how do you know, Pastor, that it was the proof of His resurrection? Well, even before He was resurrected, even before that this thing happened, there was doubts about Him. But it says there the earth shook and the stone was rolled away. And then it said the rocks begin to rain, the earth begin to quake. And that angel, that angel came by and shook that place and that Roman soldier uh, fell there upon the ground uh, and as he began this thing began to unfold what did that Roman soldier say uh, surely surely yeah. this was a son of God sure. sure you know that's not the first time that he was looked at as the son of God go back to the book of Daniel mm -hmm. remember Shadrach Meshach and Abednego yeah. I always want to call them by the right name. That's their bondage name. But that seems to be easier to remember than Hananiah. Somebody help me. Azariah and Michelle. Good job. Shadrach, Mishak, and Abednego is the way we know them. But they're Azariah, Mishak. What is that again? Hananiah, Azariah, Michelle. They were those guys. Remember them in that furnace? <laughs> And they're there and they're bound and they're in that furnace. Roman soldier. <coughs> there in the tomb. He said, surely this is the Son of God. Mm -hmm. the king looks down in that fire. <laughs> he began to question. Did we not throw three men? In the fire? Yeah, bound. Bound. In the fire. They ain't coming back. 
Heated up seven times hotter than before. We lost some of ours putting them in there. There's a thought. Yes, three men are in that fire. They ain't coming out. Well, I see four up walking in the midst of that fire. They're not bound. And what did you say the fourth one was? He said he has the appearance. Now, the non-inspired version of the Bible, the NIV, will tell you the appearance of one of the sons of the gods. No. Read it. That's what it says. I don't want, I don't want that Bible. No. The true Word of God tells us and the fourth has the appearance of the Son of God. So Jesus didn't just show up in a manger. He's always been on His Father's man. But yet that happened. That began to unfold to, to show us His deity. He went on to say in verse 12 of chapter 5, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, that all have sinned. For unto till the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who is the figure of him that was to come? But not at the offense, so also is the free gift. For it through the offense of one man, or for one many be dead, much more the grace of God. And the gift by grace, which is by one man, who is that? Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Now, that's a lot of reading, but I want you to get verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For as through the, the offense of one, many be dead. If we depend on the natural side, we're in trouble. Yes. Paul and I were going to Alabama. And those of you who don't know it, Jeremy Camp's got a new song. <laughs> Dead Man Walking. And they played that song, what? 15 times in that trip that we at went. Least. We got back and I dropped him off at the house and I was heading home. And there it was, it came on the radio. I just took a picture of the radio and sent it to him. Dead Man Got my truck here, so every time it comes on, I want to text Paul. This is all there. This wonderful song. It is. It's a wonderful song. And this song here, it reflects just what the Scripture is saying to us. Because that's where we were. If we're depending on our natural side. If we're depending on this natural side of us, we're dead men walking. And before Jesus paid that great price, before we accepted that free gift, we're all about gifts at Christmas season, right? These kids that are in here, they make their Christmas list and they talk to mom and they throw hints out and done all these things. Mama's already went and bought her Christmas and daddy go find out what she got on Christmas morning number four. Man, UPS is at my house every day. One man said the other day, he said, UPS man told me Merry Christmas like he's not going to see me 20 more times before Christmas. So the gifts there, the list is there. But there's a free gift that's been given. He said on the father, on the mother side, on the natural side, on that physical side, we were dead men walking. We had no hope. We had no we were left there in a bad state. He said, for through the offense of one men he'd be dead. Much more the grace of God. He wrote in another place where sin does abound. The grace of God there does much more abound. It may seem helpless. It may seem hopeless. It may seem like there's no way out. But that's on the natural side. I told you at the beginning of the service, I have concerns this time of year. I miss my mom like crazy this time of year. But I look beyond and past the hat. And I look to His Son. Yes. Yes. Oh, I want to see Him. Amen. Look upon His face. There to sing forever of His amazing grace. 
Sister Pat led us this morning. Oh, come let us adore you. That's what those wise men, those shepherds said on that first Christmas home. Come let us adore you. That's why we should. Why are you going to church three times a week? Well, I got to go and adore you. Oh, come let us adore you. Why are you here this morning to adore Him? Why did you get up this morning? What's your purpose? Uh, what, what's your reason for facing another day? Uh, oh, hey, to know for me to live is Christ uh, and to die is gain. Uh, so I'm a broke today. Uh, and we get up on Monday morning uh, and people say, well, what's on the agenda today? Some say, well, I've got to go hit the time clock. Some have got to go to school. Uh, some say, well, uh, here's Monday. And they say, well, wait a minute. I'm not too worried about Monday because I'm retired. Uh, what it's not any of those appointments uh, and those concerns uh, that should get us. Uh, but why are we here? It's concerning His Son. Paul wanted to get that point across to us. He said, by one man, Jesus Christ. You know what that is? Verse 5, he tells us, it's the fruit of it. The fruit of it. All that He said, all that He shared there, verse 3 and verse 5, Concerning the Son, He talked about where He came from on the natural side and where He came from on the spiritual side. But verse 5, He gives us the fruit of it. He said, by whom, uh, that is by creed Christ, uh, manifested and made known in the Gospel. Paul said we, and when He said we there, uh, He was speaking of Himself and the rest of the ministers there at His time. Uh, and Paul was speaking prophetically as well uh, to all the ministers that would ever come. So Paul was speaking for me. If you're a minister of the gospel, brother, I know what he was speaking for you. Yeah. Before we was ever conceived in our mother's womb, right. Paul was speaking for us as the man. He said, I want to, to speak up in here too and that there's something made known in the gospel. And he said, we, Paul, uh, and all of us ministers, uh, we've received the grace. Uh, and not only have we received the grace, uh, he said, the apostleship. Uh, he said, we've received grace uh, and we've got something to talk about, uh, but also the apostleship. That is, uh, we've received the favor uh, to be made apostles. Uh, how beautiful are the feet you will later wrote. Uh, how beautiful are the feet of those the gospel. How will they know without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they're sent? Listen, don't feel bad for the preacher. Oh, but I'm thankful to know in this great responsibility that say that it's one of the top four hardest jobs in the world is to be a pastor. Don't feel bad for me because of that because one of the greatest things in the world is to be a preacher. Amen. To be a minister of this great gospel. And Paul says here uh, that we have been made apostles. The apostles, uh, though at that time and still today, have made a spectacle to the world. They led a life of toil. They led a life of trouble. They were hazard. They were killed all the day for day long. Yet Paul reckons the apostleship a favor. He said it's favor. Paul shares in his testimony many times how he bore stripes, how he was shipwrecked, and all of these things that he went through. It put his life in danger to be a minister of the gospel. But he said, I count it great favor. Great favor. By whom that is. That's the fruit of it. That's why he came. That's why he came and appeared in a manger. That's why he lived. And he began to make disciples. And that's why he went to the cross. And that's why he died there on that cross. That's why he was buried. And that's why he rose again. And that's why he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. And that's why he appeared to you, whatever scene it was, whether in a church house or driving down the road. My sister texted my dad the other day and said in the text, he poured into me. I said, I got saved at my desk this morning. So no matter where it was at that you got saved, it was, that gospel was presented to you. It was for that purpose and for that reason that He came. And it's all through that it was favor that was given. Now we may justly reckon it to be great favor. We've got to understand something that Paul understood. It's great favor to be engaged, to be employed, to be about the Father's business, be your step always about in the work of the Lord for as much as you know uh, that your labor is not in pain in the Lord. What a great privilege it is uh, to be working for the King of Kings. Uh, whether it's speaking the front step, uh, preaching the gospel, uh, be taking out tracts, uh, whatever it is, uh, what a great joy it is. That's why He came. Whatever difficulties you may face in that. We're going to talk about some of those tonight. 
whatever dangers we may meet within our desire to fulfill the will of God. He understood something. The apostleship was received for obedience to the faith. To bring people to that obedience. An apostle and minister, Paul understood this. And every minister that came after him, if they did not get this, they're out of the ministry now. I've read statistics. I'm sure Brother Underwood's read statistics. It says five years. Five years after stepping out of seminary, Bible college, credentialing, whatever it is, usually five years, a great percentage of ministers stop ministering. Why? Because they forgot what Paul wrote here. It's not about you, sir. It's not about you, man. It's not concerning you. It's not concerning you at all. He said they hate you because they first hated me. That was a tough thing for me to get in ministry. Why don't they like me? Everybody likes me. I like God. And there's a lot of people that just did not like me. And I didn't get it. And the Lord had to remind me, it's not about you. It's about the stand that you take. It's about the gospel that you preach. It's about the stand that you uphold. None of those are yours. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. You're nothing without me. But with me, concerning is concerning me. So he said, don't take that load upon you. On the natural side, we want to take that load upon us. But he says, all concerning my son. He said, you've got to preach concerning my son. You've got to live concerning my son. And when you forget that it's about him and not about you, you're going to drop out as well. But would you all pause and always remember, it's concerning the son. The trial is concerning the son. Don't think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Understanding that the apostleship was received out of obedience to the faith to bring people to that obedience as Christ, as his ministers received that free gift, that they might give that same. Yet Paul was for this obedience among all nations, for he was the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul went everywhere, didn't he? I think they wrote that song about Paul. I've been everywhere, man. He went everywhere. We find John the Revelator in this year of Revelation. I want to give you this, and I'm going to try to bring this thing in for a landing. He saw him, and this is what he said. Revelation chapter 1 of that encounter. Jesus had already came, already died, resurrected, back at the right hand of the Father. Stephen had already spoke up in the book of Acts and said, I see him, giving us proof that he's back at the Father's side. John the Revelator says this, And when I saw him, he told us that I was in this place on the Lord's day. He said, I don't know if I was in the natural or in the spiritual. I don't know if I was awake or asleep. I said, but I saw it. I don't know if it was a dream or a vision. But all I know is I was called up to the third heaven. I saw him. And when I saw him, he was dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Understand something, church. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us for a purpose. And that was to show us the way. Amen. Everything you read in our, your Bible is to bring us to Jesus Christ. Yes. Everything that we do in this Christmas season, and really all year round, should also bring us closer to Jesus Christ. Amen. But it also should bring others to a saving knowledge of Him. He would be speaking, and we should be speaking of those things and doing those things concerning His Son. Jesus said this, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. That was the mission of His Son. Concerning the Son, that's it. Seek Him to save that which is lost. So concerning the church, after Jesus is there, John the Revelator said, I saw Him. Stephen said, I saw Him. He's not here. He's risen. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's back in heaven. He said, if I go away, I'll send you another comforter. He 
So now we're living in a dispensation in the time of the Holy Ghost. Third person of the Godhead is with us. He's empowered us. He said, I'm going to give you another comfort. He said, you shall receive power. When you receive that power, you're going to be witness to me. And he looked back and he said, you are the body of what? Christ. You are the embodiment of Christ. The Holy Ghost dwelling in you. God in you. He said, when Jesus comes, He's a man of God with us. When the Holy Ghost came, He's God in us. Empowering us. He said, we're the body of Christ and members in particular. And so, when we're talking about concerning Christ, what do we call ourselves and what have others told us? Christian. Correct? And what does the word Christian mean? Christ like or in the likeness of Christ. And Paul told us that we are that body of Christ members in particular. So we are ambassadors of Christ. So we want to know what should concern us. What could the things concerning us be? We need to be doing the things that concern His Son. We need to be looking to say what should concern me. The things concerning His Son. What concerned His Son? To seek and to save that which is lost. And to say this, He said also to make disciples of all men. Listen. God will save them. Then it's up to us to make disciples out of them. Teach them the Word of God. Teach them the ways of the Word of God. And so we understand that we should be speaking of those things, doing those things concerning the Son. Sister Yoda, if you'll come and help me close this morning. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Verses 30 and 31. John chapter 20 and John chapter 21 are some fascinating chapters in the Bible. Because this comes in a time Jesus crucified, He's went back, He's at the right hand. The Father seen, they didn't know where He was at, they didn't know what to do. And Peter, the one that He said, lay down your nets, I'll make you fishers of men. He's here. He's, he's denied Christ three times. He don't know what that means. All the others left. But Peter followed afar off. And when he followed afar off, he denied him three times. Brother Ben preached a wonderful message about that. Our youth revival. Back to school revival. He heard that cock crow. And Brother Ben said, I'm sure every time Peter heard a crop, cock crow after that, it reminded him of his failure. But he heard that and he said he ran out and he wept bitterly. He didn't know what any of this meant for his ministry, his future. What now? So there's a lot that begins to unfold. Peter's gone back to fishing. He's the leader, so everybody else follows him. Christ appears to him. He has a meal prepared for him on the fire in John 21. But here in the midst of all of this, in John 20, verse 30 and 31. <coughs> says, and many other signs. This is right after Thomas, who didn't see it the first time he appeared to him. Thomas said, I don't believe it unless I see it. And Jesus said to him, there's my hand. There's my son. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. The writer here said, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through His name. There's much more, much more that can be preached about Jesus this morning. Much more that I can preach concerning His Son. But that has been preached he said, that has been written, every bit of it, this, for this purpose, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's why this was written. That's why it was given to us. Just close it, that's why I preach. That's why these singers sing, these Sunday school teachers teach. That's why we carry this gospel. That's why you witness on your job and at your school. For what purpose? 
that others might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life to His name. But before you can ever share anything with anybody else for them to believe, you must believe. Jesus asked one man, he said, do you believe? And his statement, his answer always just blew my mind. Yes, Lord, I believe. Forgive my unbelief. And there may be those here this morning in that same place. Yeah, I believe. It's Christmas season. I believe that Jesus is the reason for the season. But if you're honest this morning, you'd have to say, Lord, forgive my unbelief. Because my belief has not employed me or empowered me or pushed me or gave me an urgency to reach someone else that they may believe too. Because if you truly believe Jesus the Christ, He will deliver men from their sins. You're going to find a sinner and tell them Jesus is the answer. This is the reason. I want to talk to you concerning this. The Horn family wrote a song. That song starts out similar words to that. It says, can I ask you a question? Do you know Jesus? Can I tell you about it? What an opportunity that we have to talk to somebody who don't know you. It's wonderful to preach to people to know about Him and they'll say, Amen. It kind of fuels us to preach. But I love those opportunities. As I told you last Sunday, I want to have those sitting within our congregation who thanks Job as job, Psalms as palms, meaning they know nothing about it, but they're hungry. So tell me more about this Jesus. Tell me more about this Jesus. That puts the responsibility on us, the church, to tell them everything concerning His. We stand with Him this morning. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for this Christmas season that is all about those things concerning Your Son. Really, every day of the year is all about the things concerning Your Son. How He came, how He lived, how He died, how He was resurrected, how He's still alive and well today in redeeming souls. And he's here to seek and to save that which is lost. There's one under the sound of my voice today who does not know You. The fullness of His resurrection. I pray, God, that You just reveal Yourself to them this morning. They'll find an altar, repent of their sins, and turn their lives over to You. Those of us who walking in a salvation experience. We have a greater desire to know more about the things concerning His Son than the things concerning circumstances, situations, troubles, and trials. We put our focus on those things that concern Jesus. Let that light be in us. We may be a great example to the world that's lost and dying and they need to know. Touch us around these altars this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Will you come today, maybe you don't know Him as your Savior, you want to come to the Lord, will you come? Maybe you just want to talk to Him and say, talk to me a little bit more, Father, concerning Your Son. Tell me all about it. I want to know more about it. I need His touch. I need His hand. Reach down. Goodness.